Hello, and uh, now it's time to sit down and just review terms. Uh, what I want to do is I just want to talk you through uh, the vocabulary, the glossary. The way the final exam will work will be that there I put in about 113, I think was the exact count of questions. And then the test will randomly select for each one of you it's a set of 100 questions, one point apiece. Simple enough. Um, the uh, all half of this you've already covered, and that was on for exam one. This exam will be cumulative, but a lot of these terms we've discussed and hit many, many times. So uh, I would hope that through your readings and through the time in class, uh, you have at least half, if not more, especially with your previous studies. So uh, this will be. Um, like I said, 100 questions, one point apiece. Now, some of y'all didn't do so well on the midterm. Blow this out of the water. I'll replace that grade with this grade. Uh, this is cumulative, and I want it to be a chance to see uh, how much you have uh, pulled in in terms of the terminology we use in um, field production, studio production. So, uh, put on your seatbelts. Let's go. <laughs> All right, I've got my list right here uh, that I drew the uh, exam from. So that's what I'm going to be going through. I have I started right off with ENP, ENP, EFP, and ENG. ENG remember is short for electronic news gathering. EFP is electronic field production. The basic differentiation between these two is purpose. Uh, electronic news gathering can be as simple as run and gun where you've got a photographer or a shooter or a videographer that's what I used to do I was a news photog um, and you've got your tripod your lights batteries etc and you go out in the field uh, your reporter has a microphone you plug in you shoot your stand-ups your uh, b-roll etc that's a very simple ENG ENG also can be as elaborate as a connection to a sat truck or a microwave uh, van or something like that. Uh, the key is electronic news gathering. The focus is on the news gathering part. Um, usually it's run and gun, you know, single photographer, but sometimes it can be more elaborate. Electronic field production is a, a much broader uh, capacity or capability. It could be multi-camera. Uh, you may be going out into the field to shoot, uh, and you have the sound, the secondary sound system. Uh, you have extensive lighting, things like that. Um, again, it's more to the purpose. You're there to produce the event. You're there to uh, produce a commercial, a film, you know, whatever it might be. So key differentiation, I would say, between EFP and ENG is what you're going to do, who you're producing it for. Um, Nonlinear editing. Nonlinear editing is really what is the norm now. Editing with a computer. Uh, you're used to it. The term comes from when we were making the transition from tape based editing, which was linear. You would build this part and then add this part and add this part and add this part and add this part, and you built really in a linear fashion. Nonlinear editing. You can work a little bit here, and because all you're building is a uh, set of instructions, and then work over here, and oh, now we got this part, we can edit this in. So you're not really tied to building things in order in a linear fashion. You can pretty much shift and move things around because you're working in a computer-based platform. So you'll still hear the term, though, non-linear editing and linear editing. Remember, linear editing is tape-based, basically, whereas non-linear editing is computer-based and it gives you the flexibility to move parts around and try different things and you know when I used to preview in linear editing I would go for it and perform it and then it was done you know I couldn't go back and change things without having to re-record and snip off a little bit more here a little bit more here to cut into and it really got um, it really got complicated at times but with nonlinear if I don't like it I just shift around an endpoint and an outpoint because I'm not working on the actual content. I'm working on the instructions on how to use that content.
So for a simple editor, uh, answer, nonlinear editing is where you use a computer for your editing and you can very easily move content around, or manipulate the content. SOT, sound on tape. You're getting your primary audio from the person who's being interviewed or the person who's doing the stand-up. Uh, sound on tape. It's a primarily a news term. I want to get a, a, a voiceover with sound on tape of the person doing an interview. Floor director. You know that. That person says, you do this, you do this, you do this. I ears, nose, and throat, if you will, of the director on the studio floor. Technical director runs a video switcher. Audio engineer is in charge of the overall audio for the production. Um, A1 is sometimes how they'll be referred to. Um, then you may have an A2 who assists, but the audio engineer is the person in charge of getting the best sound for the production. Lighting director in charge of the lighting, trying to maximize lighting uh, resources and tools to get the best look. The cam op, camera operator, operates the camera. Uh, focal length, that is the length of the lens, from the center of the lens to the front imaging plate. And the longer the focal length, the smaller the field of view. Remember I told you to put your hand, uh, your eye up, uh, ring, your finger in a ring up by your eye, and the more you extend it, the smaller the area in front. It is inside that ring. So your focal length. Depth of field, that's the area. Pardon me, let me adjust my lighting here. Be a, there we go. It looks like I shifted. Um, the uh, where was I before I so really interrupted myself? Depth of field. That's the area in front of the camera where the image is in focus. Um, remember the three things that affect depth of field: your focal length, and the longer your focal length, the shallower your depth of field. The shorter your uh, fo focal length, the deeper your depth of field. That's why if you zoom in all the way on my face, my nose, if you go all the way in, would be in focus, but my eyeball may not be. But as you come out with a shorter focal length, the whole face would be in focus. Other two things that affect focal length, one is uh, the camera to subject distance. The farther away the subject is, the broader the depth of field. And that's why in your cameras you have an infinity signal symbol at uh, the farthest setting for your lens because everything farther than that would be in focus if you set your focus there. The uh, third thing is the size of your aperture. The larger your aperture, the more randomized light that can come in and the, the more the diffusion, the smaller the depth of field because of all that randomized light. If you have a very small aperture, uh, that means you would have more direct light coming off the subject, and you would have a broader, uh, a deeper uh, depth of field. So remember, the larger the aperture, uh, the uh, the larger the aperture, the shallower your depth of field. The longer the focal length, the shallower the depth of field. But the longer the camera to subject distance, the larger, the deeper the depth of field. Shutter speed. Uh, you do not have a continuous exposure of light to the imaging device. You have a shutter that shuts it off so they can, it can capture each image instead of a blur. Well, the faster your shutter speed, that means you're uh, not allowing as much light per exposure because it's going faster. Um, why would you use a faster shutter speed? Because if you have motion, you would have the possibility of movement in front of the camera. And if you have a quick shutter speed, a fast shutter speed, you have the individual images much more crisper. With a sl slower shutter speed, you would have the blur as it would be exposed to the light reflecting off the motion. So things like sports, um, anything with a fast action, we, might, we would use a faster shutter speed. Uh, anything like, let's say, right here, I'm talking, I am not moving around that much. Therefore, we can go with a slower shutter speed uh, if we were shooting, and that way pick out the nuances in the light if we uh, so desired. So different shutter speeds have their purposes and their advantages. Uh, camera gain. Okay, camera gain is like turning the volume up on your audio. 
camera game does the same thing with the visual signal. It boosts the visual signal. So if you're in a minimum light situation, you can boost the game and uh, bring out more of the image than you might see. It might not you might not be able to see unless you did that. Think of the ISO on your camera. That's basically what camera gain is for a video camera. Now, and like ISO, the more you boost the gain, the more likely you're to have noise. You're, you have a, that fuzzy, uh, noisy signal. You know, just like if you push your ISO on your uh, camera, your still camera, you get kind of a grainy look. Well, the same thing is true with video. The more you push your gain, the more grain you get in the picture. So it's kind of a trade-off. Uh, but sometimes that's all you can do. Think about your uh, cell phone camera. If you're shooting in an environment that has very low light, okay, you hold up your camera, let's say it's somebody's birthday party and all you have is the candles. Well, you're looking at the candles and they're like glowing, but then you turn over and then your camera tries to, your camera phone tries to adjust and bring out and make a video image, well, you'll see a lot more grain, a softer image. That's the effect of camera gain. A fast lens. A fast lens is a lens that uh, requires uh, less light. Uh, it doesn't suck up as much light. And what do I mean by that? If I'm shooting in an environment that has, okay, one of the problems we've had at times with going and shooting video, let's say at uh, the Miss NGU uh, pageant, there is not as much light, at least in some of the acts. So people would take still pictures and they would be dark. And the reason was is they would grab one of the zoom lenses that uh, is a very slow lens. It requires a lot of light, but they want to be able to zoom in and get close. Well, they'd zoom in and get close, but they'd lose a lot of the light because it was a slow lens. It needs a slow shutter speed. Uh huh. What happens when, when you have a slow shutter speed? You get more blur. You know, if the camera shakes, you get that blur of the shaking. Well, the same thing is true with video. If you use a faster lens, it uh, can use a quicker shutter speed and get a more crisp image in a, a crisper image in a dark setting. And we use these kind of lenses on sports uh, for sports lenses because they are extremely long. They lose a lot of light. So what they'll do is they'll use a very expensive glass to make use of every bit of light that comes in so that you can zoom all the way in and get the close up on the quarterback, you know, or something like that. So a fast lens require, doesn't require as much light. It's used with, it can be used with a fast shutter speed. It's more light. It conducts more light through. A slow lens needs a, shower, a slower shutter speed because it doesn't let as much light through. So a fast and a slow lens. Uh, those, the, the speed of the lens is measured by an f-stop rating. We have some 1.8 uh, f-stop lenses. Well, those are very fast lenses. Uh, they have very minimum knockdown of the light. Our, uh, but they're prime lenses. They're only one length. They're 50 millimeter lenses, and that's all you can get. You, if you want to move, get a tighter shot, you have to get the camera closer which is really more filmic in the way people would shoot. We also have some sport lenses. Now outside they work pretty good, but more if you're shooting sports, let's say in a basketball arena that's not that well lit, they're slower and so they suck up a lot of light instead of, and they, they don't make efficient use of the existing light. So in summary, a fast lens, uh, makes great use of the available light. It doesn't knock down as much light. A slow lens locks, knocks down more of the light. The main difference, uh, why would you use a, why would you be hesitant to use a fast lens? Because they are so expensive. So you, you know, it depends on how much money you're willing to spend. Uh, wide angle lenses, that's another word for a short lens. Uh, a short lens shoots at a wider angle has a wider angle field of view. Uh, macro position. Okay, I wish I had a lens here to show you, but they uh, back where the back focus ring is, sometimes you can want to focus on something. Let's say if I wanted to shoot my hand, you know, I'm going to show off my ring and I want to get a camera really close. Well, that's, you know, cameras have a, a place in front of them in their normal lens settings 
where things go out of focus. It's kind of like my eyes where I have to wear reading glasses. Well, the macro lens is kind of like reading glasses for your camera to enable you to get closer and get in and get a better focus. And it has a setting on that for that. Uh, field of view, that's basically the area in front of the camera that you can see. You, know, you zoom in, you have a smaller field of view. If you zoom out, you have a larger field of view. Aspect ratio, the ratio of height to width of the camera, uh, of the image. Uh, you can, the old standard was a 3 by 4 ratio. The newer standard is 9 by 16. Closure. Okay. This basically is the idea that if a, uh, that we psychologically complete. Remember I told you about the cutoff lines. Well, you could do a cutoff here and here, and still that, would be, that wouldn't be an uncomfortable shot except for the fact you're up in my face. But if I cut off here, now it looks like we got a floating head. Um, closure allows us to psychologically complete the image. Uh, we pro mentally provide the closure to the image. We do it right here. We have a termination point, and now all of a sudden we've got a head that's floating around. It's, it's more of a psychological, a way to kind of show part to mean the whole, uh, and we mentally provide the closure. Tilt. This is tilting a camera up. This is tilting a camera down. Um, a nose room. You know, if I'm if I'm turning, I'm giving myself space. Remember your rule of thirds. The rule of thirds, where you have you know your. Let me see if I can do this right. Down here, and then you have your. Boy, I'm working backwards. And then you have your lines right across here at the thirds. Um, well, nose room is you let your you put your head over here on this side on that third line and that gives you look look space over here i'm going backwards here okay this gives you the nose room area in front of your nose to give yourself a plate give your talent a place to look if you will no this this is my book to give my nose room okay yeah i knew something felt wrong so i'm giving myself nose room looking this way uh i will i found a video an interesting video on the rule of thirds and i'll post it onto the facebook group and put it in blackboard a nice explanation for uh, how we use the third rule of thirds and the intersection points i'll put post that for you uh truck that is when the camera itself moves from left to right makes sense that's a truck dolly in, dolly out, sorry about that. Uh, that's when the camera moves in or away from the subject. Uh, tongue, it's not this thing. Tongue is where you have a camera on the end of a jib and then you move the camera back and forth and let's say the camera, as you're coming, shifts its angle and you kind of come around the subject. Two shot, two people in the shot, uh, 180 degree axis. Okay, this especially when we're shooting in a live event type production. Think in terms of the line of action in this conversation. Right now, it's from me to you. So that means every if we were shooting, let's say if it was a running thing, if I shoot, if I have a camera over here looking at me, and then I cut to a camera over here, this camera sees me looking from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of the frame, but this camera sees me looking from the left-hand side of the frame, to, I mean, looking the opposite direction because it's on the opposite side of this 180-degree axis. And so my head would go looking from looking this way in one image to this way in the other image, and that can be confusing, especially if you have something like someone like a running back running from one end of the field to the other. It looks like they changed direction in the middle of their run. So we, what we do is we have the 180 degree access, axis. So there's, imagine a line running right down the middle of your, your motion, your axis of motion. And what you do is you, everything needs to be, okay, I'm backwards as I'm looking at this. Everything would need to be on one side of this line in the 180 degree arc. So as long as all my cameras are on one side of this axis, I mean the proper visual perspective for all of the action in front of me. But if I go on the other side, I've now reversed the direction. This is uh, extremely important, like I said, for shooting um, 
court type events, things like that. Uh, when you're shooting in chapel, um, they actually have two axes of action. You have one on the stage across, and then you have one from audience to stage. Now, during the music, you got a lot of interaction between the musicians on the stage, and that works for shooting a lot of this stuff. But when it comes time for the sermon, a lot of the action is from the stage to the people who are viewing a different line of action. So, you know, you got to keep these things in mind so you don't cause uh, visual confusion for people who are watching what's going on. You know, uh, you let's say you have a chase scene going on in a film, and two people, one person is pursuing the other. Well, if you reverse the axis of direction, uh, the axis for your cameras. It looks like all of a sudden now the person who was the chaser now has become the chasee or the chased. So uh, be aware of this axis, uh, the 180 degree axis. A cant. A cant is also called a Dutch angle. It's basically when you give an angled look, you put it, you know, uneven. Now, why do we people use this? Sometimes called a Dutch angle. I don't know why people keep on picking on the Dutch, Dutch tree, Dutch angle. Anyway. That's an aside, that may be more of a philosophical question. But this would be a cant, as opposed to a more level shot. Now, uh, people generally prefer to have a level shot, uh, but why would we use a canted angle? To create tension. If you need a reminder, go back and watch, go YouTube and look at the, uh, the scene where Pee Wee Herman finds that his bike has been stolen. Uh, that canted angle creates a tension of his distress over losing his beloved bike. And that sets up the quest for the movie. Uh, pan. I think I told you before, pan is when you're turning the camera up and left and right. Hope you enjoy the tour of my house. Uh, and the tilt up and down. CCU. CCU is short for a camera control unit. It's part of the camera chain. A camera chain is uh, the camera through the cables back to the CCU camera control unit into the video switcher. Um, it's the CCU is where you have all the remote control functions for the camera. During an event, a camera operator that needs to be focused on getting a good image, uh, delivering a good image, a good look to the director. Uh, if, if the cam op has to worry about iris color balance and all these other elements while they're also trying to use the camera, operate the camera to get good pictures. It's a lot going on and it can be um, prohibitive to doing an effective job. So you'll have a, vo a video engineer sitting back there at the CCU uh, controlling the iris, you know, the brightness settings as the sun goes down, uh, changing white balance as you're going from sunlight to maybe mercury vapor, other kinds of lamps there. So, um, you know, the, okay, sorry about that. I just got a, uh, I, I'm waiting on an email <laughs> for a meeting I was supposed to go to. The, um, so, uh, CCU, uh, the video engineer basically can take over a lot of the technical functions on the camera and free the camera operator up to do what they're supposed to do, which is provide good images. Uh, CMOS and CCD, these are basically two imaging technologies. CCD was the older digital imaging uh, chip, uh, charge coupling device was cost, and then you have the CMOS, which is the newer, and actually gaining in a lot of popularity. But they're both two types of imaging devices used in uh, video cameras now, uh, be they DSLR, uh, portable video cameras are the bigger video cameras. Bean splitter. Okay, light comes into the camera through the lens and then it hits a prism that will divide the light up into its red, green, and blue components. And it, you know, bounces the green here, the red, actually I think green goes straight through, red goes up, blue goes down. And they have CCDs or CMOS chips that then receive uh, the uh, I believe it would be CCD chips that uh, pick up the red, green, and blue images to give you your component signal. Remember component video? Uh, high depth, you're, and it will bring, it actually sends the red, green, and blue information down on separate channels as opposed to trying to combine them into one signal. Hue. This is the actual color 
in an image, red, blue, green, the color itself. Uh, luminance is the brightness of a color. Uh, you know, um, pink would have a high, high luminance. Uh, maroon has a low, low uh, luminance level. Uh, saturation is, if you will, the content, the, the intensity of the color. Uh, this blue does not have that high of a saturation level as opposed to, well, I can't move that, but, uh, you know, a, uh, say the blue on that <laughs> pot right there. You know, it's dark, but it's got a very blue, blue, higher saturation. So those are the different characteristics of color that we're often having to manipulate as we try to get a good color balance uh, in a system. I've done that, had to do that many times with the CCU. Uh, resolution, the amount of detail in an image. It's, usually, it's measured in lines, uh, 1080, 720, etc. Grayscale, uh, the grayscale from dark to white in shades of gray. It's used, used for setting up I used to set a white balance because if you got red, green, and blue balanced, you actually get, uh, they balance out to shades of gray when they're in balance. If you actually see color in a gray scale, that means one of your red, green, or blue are either too high or too low. So a gray scale is useful for, uh, it's a diagnostic device used for color balance. But you need to understand the gray scale just to understand the right contrast between the, the contrast ratio between the darkest darks in your image and the darkest darks in your image and your brightest whites in your image. White balance, it's the proper balancing of red, green, and blue uh, so that uh, your cam when your camera sees as white is really white, the way this works. Okay, uh, whenever they say, okay, we need to do a white balance on your camera. And they say, okay, shoot me something white. And, you know, we'll, what we'd do is we'd find a sign or something like that that was white. And then um, uh, we'd shoot that, and then the camera would automatically balance the red, green, and blue signals so that what it remembers as white matches what it's seeing as white, what you're telling it is white. Why is this important? Well, different light sources have different color temperatures, remember? Uh, incandescent light, 2800 degrees Kelvin, 3200 degrees Kelvin. Fluorescent, fluorescent light is green at uh, 4800 degrees Kelvin, roughly. Uh, sunlight and a lot of LED lights, this light that I'm using here, uh, the light is about 56 to 6500 degrees Kelvin. See, in this room right now where I'm sitting, I've got a lot of sunlight coming in through the window. I've got uh, light coming through the door in the mudroom, and that's all sunlight, so it's very blue. If I had an incandescent light, which is a lower color temperature, and I, you know the camera would balance off that to get my flesh tone, uh, all that would I would be in a room glowing blue. So what I do is I use this LED, which has the bluer light already. And I say, everything that's supposed to be white in this room, balance it. Well, internally, it'll back off on the blue signal and bring up the red and the green because the light's got so much blue in it. And that's how it gets the flesh tone to look normal. So uh, white balance is basically how we make sure ca cameras have the right color. If you want to see what bad color balance looks like, go on YouTube and you'll see people who will uh, look very orange, or maybe they look purple, or something like that, uh, you know, on their flesh tones, and you're saying, that doesn't look bad. that doesn't look good. Well, you're right, it doesn't look good. It's because of an improper color balance setting. Pixel, that's the little bitty uh, imaging dot, if you will, uh, both on the receiving in a CCD or CMOS, and in the building of the image, such as on the uh, screen display that you're probably looking at. Contrast ratio, the ratio between the uh, brightest and the darkest part of your uh, image, uh, in your image. Uh, the camera, newer cameras can handle about a 40 to 1 ratio with the, the brightest part being 40 times brighter than the darkest part. Human eye is like 100 to 200, I don't remember the exact, but we have a much, our eyes are much more uh, able to handle the high contrast uh, dynamics in an image.
High definition video. Uh, high definition video. A lot of definition in the video. Generally, those standards, uh, the minimum of 720i or p, interlace or progressive, usually it's 720p, to 1080i interlace or 1080p, 1080, uh, 1080 lines progressive. And now we're looking at 2K and 4K. Now, these are all just me uh, 4,000 lines, 2,000 lines. These are all just measures of resolution. Um, camera head, that's where the camera stuff happens. That's what's on top of the tripod. That's where the imaging, the glass is attached, the lens is attached to it, the uh, viewfinders are attached, uh, all the processing circuitry of the image, the beam splitter, your pickup to, uh, chips and all that. Oh, I almost went old school. I said pickup tubes. We haven't used those since the 90s, you know, in most applications. Panning head, that's what the uh, camera head sits on. Uh, that's where you have your tilt and fun uh, tilt and lock and tilt. You have your frictions, which help control some sort of resistance, so you can do smooth operation with your locks um, and, and controls like that. Um, then you have your pedestal or tripod. What we have in the studio, we have both the tripod, that's the three-leg thing, and then we have the pedestal, that's the one with the big ring with the steering wheel that we can raise up and down and then we can move around. That's more of a professional studio rig and uh, allows for smoother movement if you have to truck the camera or dolly in and out. Okay, and that's the content from uh, the glossary for test one. Now I'm going to go ahead and we're going to, let me see, I'm trying to get my lighting set back here. Uh, we're going to go to the glossary for test two. Uh, speaking of lighting, uh, first thing we're going to address is lighting. Uh, the base light, that's just the overall ambient light if you will, in an area. Um, in base modeling lighting, we try to establish a good, usable base light you know, so that things can be seen. And then we use specials to, uh, uh, to highlight certain areas, maybe to fill in the eyes if you have a lot of top over light or something like that. Um, uh, so the base light, just the, what meets the technical requirements. An ellipsoidal is a type of light. Remember, that's the one where they can put in the Leco or the cookie to cast a shadow image up against a backdrop or something like that. Uh, you've got a Fresnel. That's the one that has the uh, circles in the lens. That's a, a standard film and television and theater light where you can move the bulb close, uh, closer in or further back to open up to spread the light or to make it very narrow as a spotlight and pin the light. You have a clip light. That's literally a light that's on a small stand that can be clipped to something because sometimes you need to place specialty lights in some hard to get areas. This is especially true for location shooting. Incandescent lighting. This is the old standard for lighting that's got the filament in it and it's got the, the, uh, the bulb like what you'd use in your household. Uh, quartz lighting is usually this. The thing about it, it's, it's just a big broad term. Incandescent lighting uh, generally has about a 40, I mean 28 to 3200 degree Kelvin uh, color temperature. It's more yellow, orange. Incident light. Incident light is the light coming from the light source. Uh, if you have a light meter, you have you can measure incident light by looking at the light. So it would be like this light that I have, this desk light. I would hold the meter up to there, looking at the light that's being sent to my face. This is supposed to reflected light, which is when I turn the meter around, and then I'd measure the light that's bouncing off my face onto the meter. Both types of lighting are important. Incident light coming from the source, reflective light reflected off of the image you're shooting. Uh, I would measure my incident light to make sure if I've got, let's say I have to light a large stage area. Well, I would walk through with my meter and measure the evenness of the light. You know, how do I have the two light patterns overlapping to make sure that on the stage I don't have dark spots as people are watching uh, or walking around on the stage. Reflected light is something I would use maybe to measure the light on my green screen. I want a nice even green so that my keys will be simple. So I would measure how is it reflecting the light off the green scheme, screen. As long as I get a good even reading across my green screen, screen, green screen, been a long week. 
been a long three or four weeks. Um, the uh, If I can get a good measure of even lighting off my green screen, then I'll know my keys, my chroma keys, will be more effective, less, less harder to control. Uh, LED light. Uh, an LED light is simply a type of light source. Incandescent is a light source. Fluorescent is a light source. LED is a light source. It's what generates the light itself. Now you can put incandescent in a Leco or an ellipsoidal. You can put it in a Fresnel. You can put it in a scoop. That would be the housing and the construction. The light source, LED, incandescent, fluorescent, will affect greatly, will affect the color temperature because it's the actual quality of the light. If you will, the fixture, the housing, controls how you manipulate the light. That's a fair way to describe it. So if you're looking at a scoop, just a big, like a scoop, it's used, put your light element in the back, usually in a condescent, but you can do it with an LED, and it just spreads out a wash of light. We've talked about the Leco or the ellipsoidal. That's what they use a lot of at the, the, at the theaters, you know, to set the spots uh, and the areas that they're lighting on the stage down at the uh, theater. Some of them can be bare, narrow spots. If they want to light a small area or wide washes, they can use the shorter lenses on the Leco and spread their light out. Uh, color temperature, you know what I mean by that, the color of the light, literally. Uh, remember, incandescent is about 28 to 3200 degrees Kelvin. Fluorescent is about 48. Uh, when you move up to sunlight, a lot of the LED lights, you're looking at 56, <coughs> excuse me, 56 to 6500 degrees Kelvin. A dimmer. A dimmer is simply a fancy resistor that controls the amount of power going to a lighting element. It's your dimmer switch. You know, you turn it up, you get brighter light, you turn it down, you get darker light. Now, uh, in our lighting and theater and all that terms, the dimmer itself is where that happens. You know, the variable levels of resistance are applied to knock down the voltage that gets out to the light or the wattage. Um, so usually you'll have dimmer packs that are set aside and then you'll have a controller that controls where the light and where the power is routed through the dimmer. Uh, a flag. It, a flag would be something like this. And let's say I want to mask, I want to mask off my bald spot, <laughs> which is my head. Uh, a mask will control the light, a flag, excuse me can be used to control where the light goes. Now, you're saying, why? Well, that's kind of silly on your head, but yeah. But now let's say, let's see if I, I saw this working. Okay, you see how on the behind, on the wall behind me, I let's say I wanted to prevent light from hitting, let's say, I think I used the illustration. We're doing the, um, um, we're doing the resurrection, it's Easter weekend. And we want, uh, we don't want any light to be seen on the tomb, but we want when Jesus steps out, he's full of the light. Well, we may use a flag to make sure light doesn't hit the edge of the tomb, just like it's being masked off part of this wall, so that the only light is that which is in that black hole until Jesus steps out and bam, bright lights. That's something you might use a flag for. On a Leco, you actually have little barn doors, and it, uh, well, on a, I shouldn't use that term. On a, a Fresnel, we have barn doors. Those are those black flaps that can be used to shape the light and control the light. In Alico, you have shutters that internally can set hard edges. And those are really great for that type of theatrical effect. We can mask it off so you don't see any light spillage onto an area surrounding the hole. But all this light is pumping into the hole. But since there's nothing in that hole, to reflect the light, you can't see it until someone steps into the light and bam, there they are brightly lit. A cookie or a gobo, a shadow cutout that can put a letter or a star pattern, tree branches or something, so you can create shadows on a backdrop. Key light, the main light on the subject. Uh, here in my house, this is my key light off to the side, but I also have my sunlight coming in from this direction to kind of provide fill on this side of my face. Um, backlight, that would be a light behind me. I really don't have one in here. 
but you know, we've talked about the three-point lighting. Fill light, again, the light on this side of my face. Side light would be a light. I'll keep on getting bit by moving that light. Um, a side light would be like a, a light literally to the side to uh, maybe pr put a rim up on the subject or something like that. Fall off. Okay, now you see behind me against the wall the, the shadow of my head. Well, that, you see how you can see a sharp line on the, I guess, on the image. You look to the left-hand side, you see that sharp edge. That would be a fast fall off. That's how fast uh, the light goes from shadow or shade to bright. Uh, on the other side, though, to the right, right by the, uh, you know, closer to that, is that a hat? No, that's just to the coat. Okay. Closer to the coat that's hanging up on the wall, you see how the wall, the light kind of slowly transitions from uh, shadow to uh, light? That is a slow fall off. So we have a clean, uh, crisp shadow, fast fall off. We have a more diffuse shadow, that's a, a slow fall off. Uh, diffuse light. Diffuse light just means softer ed edges. Uh, your shadows are softer, your images are a little bit uh, more diffused. Um, it helps prevent having a lot of hard dramatic shadows uh, in your image uh, as opposed to directional light which hits you like this light does directly so it produces you know a harsher shadow like right here as the light is uh, reflecting on my face or maybe under my chin, whichever chin you want to count. But anyway, that was a joke. Cross keying. That's where I might use uh, two lights set up at an angle from two areas to shoot in a cross pattern on people, two people who are doing an interview. And I'm using them, uh, instead of setting up three point lighting on each person, I'm cross keying. The, uh, it becomes a backlight for one and a key light. Uh, for the other and vice versa, uh, letting light serve multiple purposes as they, as they light up the area. The uh, background light is lighting on the background uh, so that you can see. You know, we really need it for a green screen. It has to be very even. Um, but even, you know, just in a normal setting, you might, let's say a preacher's preaching, and then they put the, can the uh, I've seen this at one church where they would put blues on the choir. Instead of having the choir fully lit, because if the choir is, was fully lit, lit uh, visually it would be competing with, you know, and distracting from the preacher. So they would put a blue wash over the choir, that kind of mutes the background, and then the sharp, uh, crisp lighting on the preacher. So uh, background lighting is the lighting you use on the background to achieve whatever effect you want. Uh, a kicker light, that's another name for a side light. Lumen and lux are units of measure, uh, uh, you know, kind of like foot candles, and you know the more lumens you have, the brighter something is. Uh, neutral density filter. This is a filter in a camera, or it can also be used as a filter on a light. That all it does without affecting the color temperature, it simply knocks down the amount of light either coming off of a light or coming into a camera. Usually we hear the term used uh, in the camera, and that's the standard place you would hear it. But a gray, uh, uh, a gray piece of gel, if you will, on a light achieves the same function. So what do we use it for? In a camera, uh, you've got sunlight coming in. It is really bright. And when sunlight is really bright, it makes it difficult for your camera to make full use of the iris to get the subtleties in because it's going to be shut almost all the way down. So you put on a neutral density filter, pardon the sound of the clock there. Uh, oh, we're at the top of the hour. No, we're not. It's quarter to, uh, three quarters of the hour. Um, so the neutral density filter knocks down the uh, amount of light coming into the camera so that you can open up your iris more and get a little bit more control. Um, you say, well, don't you want to have, uh, you know, iris shut down all the way so that you can maximize your uh, depth of field? It doesn't necessarily work in that ideal fashion. I've had times when I've worked with a camera and um, we did not have the neutral density in and the, and the iris was shut all the way down just to make an image, but the image was blurred. Um, 
because there was so much light and there was no wiggle room, you know, in setting up the iris. So I put in a new, uh, when I actually went up to two levels of neutral density. And then I uh, recorded, uh, and then I was able to set the iris. Uh, so I'm just telling my son to be quiet because I'm asking that he be quiet because I'm recording. The... Um, so I, uh, when we put in the neutral density, that gave me a little bit more play with the iris and made the camera's image look, actually look better. Uh, quartz light, it's a type of lighting source. It is a, um, kind of like, you know, the filament in a bulb uh, that you use in your lamp. It's just a type of lighting element. Normally a quartz light is at, like I said, within that 30, that 28 to 32, 200 degrees Kelvin. Contrast ratio, I have discussed the uh, the contrast between the brightest and the darkest parts of your image. Uh, photographic lighting principle, that's the three-point lighting, key, fill, and back. Uh, base modeling lighting, you establish a base level of light in your subject and then you use specials to light what needs to be light, uh, you know, highlighted. You might use, like say in this situation, I'm really using a base modeling. I just have one light that I'm using. I've got fill coming in from here, some degree of backlight perhaps, but I did bring in one light just to make sure I had enough light on the foreground image. Inverse square law. Oh yeah, that thing. Remember uh, that light intensity drops quickly as a lighting element is moved further away from a subject, uh, from the subject of your lighting. Uh, if you have 100 units, let's say, whatever those units are, 100 units of light coming from uh, hitting uh, your subject at a distance of 4 feet. If you double that distance to 8 feet, you do not have the amount of light. Rather, you reduce it by a ratio of the inverse square law. So, 4 foot would be x. So, 8 foot is 2x. Take that 2x, square the 2, you get 4. Then you invert uh, uh, 4 over 1 to 1 fourth. So, you have one, per one quarter of the light hitting the subject when you double the distance. So, instead of having 100 units of light hitting your subject, you have 25 units of light. Same principle applies to microphone distance as well. So, just something to be aware of. Uh, I'm not, you know, yeah, you need to understand the formula. The general principle is you can increase or decrease the intensity of the light by how close you have the light to the subject. Uh, we've already talked about barn doors, gels, the colored uh, somewhat transparent uh, pieces of what look like plastic that you put over a light to change the color of the light. A sight, that's the big curtain or hard wall that is that surrounds a studio. Uh, usually they are neutral colors so that you can paint them with lights. We have a hard green sight because we do the, the green screen work. It could be a black sight, whatever you wish. Now in the video switcher, uh, you have, uh, that's the next one you're moving to. Remember what a mix effects is. A mix effects it consists of two buses, which buses are the rows of video sources uh, that you can make transitions between uh, with, a, with a fader bar. That's that thing from the Death Star that they push to activate and destroy a planet. And then you have mode buttons for how you want to make the transition. Uh, do you want it to be a wipe, like the, the clock wipe, or uh, do you want it to be a dissolve, where they simply, one picture blends to the other? Uh, character generator uh, is a device that generates titles uh, and graphics and such as that. Chroma key is where you key out a particular color. Uh, we use green in the studio. Luminance key, remember I described with you how it would take the bright parts of an object and make them clear visually and then take what's left. So let's say if I was here in front of a white background, it would take all that is white and make it clear, make it kind of disappear. And then my face, my skin tones, etc. Probably, you know, I might get some weird stuff with my white lines here. I'd have to be very careful about setting the luminance key. But it would make most me appear 
and then everything else disappear. Um, the Zoom, it's funny, uh, Zoom actually can key you, pardon me, key out, find your flesh tone and your body, everything that's connected to it, and somehow take that away and put you up in space looking out. It's using the key effect too. I haven't figured that one out yet, uh, how they do that yet. Matte key. Matte key is the old way we used to do keys. And in a matte key, whereas with the luminance key, it eliminates all the black or all the white, you know, some end of the uh, grayscale. In a matte key, uh, it will take, it will do the same thing, but instead of rendering things out like in the flesh tones and all that, it's all one color. We used to use to use to do titles. Uh, I used to press type white letters on a black background. It would key out the black and then you would have a, the crisp of the white lettering. And then we can go in and change the color, but all the colors, all the letters would be the same color. So that's that's a matte key. It's not used that much anymore except maybe some artistic stuff. Effects bus, that's where we select whatever effect we're going to bring in. It could be like in a key, the source we're going to pull our key from, things like that. Preview bus, that's where you select what you're going to go to so you can look at it ahead of time. Program bus, this is what's going online, what's going on the air. Fader bar, again, the Death Star trigger. The thing that makes a transition brings what's up on the preview bus up to the program bus. Genlock, okay. You remember when I talked about uh, scanning, things have to be scanning together if they're going to be mixed. Well, Genlock is the function that allows all the, can uh, the, uh, uh, the scannings to sync up uh, uh, from your video sources. A super, uh, let me see, a dissolve, one picture blends to the other. When we do a uh, dissolve to or from black, it's fade, it's called a fade, a fade to black, or a fade up to whatever camera. Uh, cut, instantaneous change from one picture to the other. A super is kind of like a dissolve that got stuck in the middle where you're bringing two images and you just kind of had that overlap of two pictures on top of each other. Downstream key, remember downstream, um, that you know you have what comes out of your switcher, and then here's your downstream key, and this will go on top of everything that's coming out of the switcher, and if you have another downstream key or here, this goes on top of this, which goes up on top of this. It's all just downstream. Codec, a coder decoder, uh, I mean, a compressor decompressor, it's a way to process the video signal so that it can move through the narrower bandwidth. Time-based corrector. This is an old, older device that would take a video signal in. Could be from a satellite, from a sat truck, or from a camera that couldn't be uh, genlocked. And then uh, it would, it literally holds the video image for a split second until it could sync up with what's going into the switcher. And that way you can integrate outside video sources that are not locked in into your video production. The, now, one thing to remember is that there are also two different kinds of switchers with regard to this. Some of them are what we call synchronous switchers. Those are switchers that have to have all the sources synced together. Usually these are larger, more production, heavy-duty production-oriented switchers. Um, then you have non-synchronous switchers, which means they can eat anything. Um, and the only problem with these is they still have to sync up. So sometimes, especially if you're shooting like an athletic event or something that's moving, you'll get that freeze frame as it holds on to what you're cutting from before it moves to the next video source uh, because it's finally got it synced in. So that's why we like synchronous switches for like big sporting events because everything's in sync and you push the button and it cuts instead of having to go through extra steps. The uh, You can work with a non-synchronous switcher. You just have to make sure you use a preview bus so it can sync in and preview, and then you do your cut. It makes it a two-step instead of a uh, process, instead of one-step process of just hitting uh, your sources on the program bus. Uh, Component-based based video system. Uh, that means you divide the red, green, and blue and the brightness information into separate components. Brightness uh, lives on the green channel and then red and blue. Composite video signal, all these things are compressed into one video signal, which only travels down one cable, which is nice, but it's also more compressed. Therefore, it's not, it doesn't have as much detail 
uh, it doesn't look as good as a component signal. Uh, now, this is not an SDI. This is, we're talking about different types of video signals. Uh, YC component is another type of component, but instead of three channels, you have two channels, brightness and prominence. The Y is the brightness, prominence is the color. Com uh, RGB component system is a type of uh, component system, red, green, and blue. Or you might also have a Y, Y minus R, R, uh, R minus Y and a blue min uh, minus Y, which is basically the same thing as an RGB. Uh, compression, removing the unnecessary parts of an image uh, so that it can take and it, a signal can take um, less bandwidth. You know, instead of rewriting the whole background, only uh, send the information that changes what changes in the picture. Um, field log, that's where you write down. Okay, we recorded this, 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 and this. This is really helpful, especially when you're doing film type production, to make sure that you've recorded what you need. Uh, and also a film log is a record on that tape or that that now chip or uh, SD card. So you know what is on there. Uh, now one of the nice things about computer-based technology, you can actually name the files and have folders inside. It's a good idea so that way when you get into the editing process uh, you know what you have. Uh, JPEG is a, uh, a particular format for uh, still images. MPEG, MPEG4 are video codecs uh, uh, for vi visual, for video content. And a frame store synchronizer. A uh, frame store synchronizer is the kind is that device in the video switcher that's non-synchronous. It's where the image, uh, the picture, the image from the camera image from a satellite feed or something like that comes in and it is momentarily delayed until its scanning is lines up in sync with everything else then it's released. It's a It stores the frame and synchronizes it, hence the term frame store synchronizer. Now additionally for the final uh, to make sure uh, like I said know all the terms from the glossaries of the first two understand the concepts that's what we've just done. Three different production phases. Pre-production, that's where 80-90% of the work is done. It's preparation, it's the scripting, it's the site surveys, it's all this stuff. It's learning the play, it's uh, doing shot list, all this preparatory work. So then when you go in to catch the event, you're ready for it. So pre-production. Production is actually what when you do the production. Uh, you're you know, recording the game whatever it might be, recording the play. Then the post-production is where we have to do any editing, if we have to do any. Uh, crew roles above and below the line. Uh, above the line generally are where you have a lot of your pre-production and you may bring in your director as you make your planning. And then the below the line is the people who actually conduct the production technical aspects. If you will, studio ops is focuses on the below the line processes for the most part. The difference between uh, uh, you know what a uh, location survey, a site survey is. I posted that video for you as part of your pre-pro assignment. A scrim, this is uh, two other terms. Uh, a scrim is just a glass, spun glass or something like that that's used to diffuse light. Uh, uh, we use them uh, what I'll do sometimes is, so I don't have competing shadows, I'll use a direct light on a key and I might have uh, some sort of diffusion, scrim is a form of diffusion, on another light to soften the shadows uh, without you know, having just blaring lights from both sides. And a treatment is a term uh, we'll use from time to time, especially when people want to do a new program, let's say for vision, uh, vision media, vision TV. We will, a treatment is basically a description of the program, a uh, production narrative, a plan of how you're going to do it, things like that. So we can start to get an idea of the production we're going to do. Don't you love that clock? <laughs> I guess it's trying to tell me, you know, Andy, it's time to wrap this up and be quiet. So with that being said, uh, these notes are in the book. Uh, we've discussed them in class, and hopefully this video will help you as you prepare for your final exam. All the best, and looking forward to seeing y'all in the fall. Take care.